Now today we're going to talk about Luke 1. Actually, I have a visual aid here for Luke 1 uh, that we can see. We have, I'm assuming this is Mary and Elizabeth, uh, right? This, is, this has got to be a Mary and Elizabeth with, uh, with I guess, uh, let's say, okay, so this is Mary, I imagine, so this must be Jesus. This is Elizabeth, so this is uh, John the Baptist. So keep that in mind, keep that visual aid in mind as we go through all this. And we go through it. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the visitation. But before that, we really need to talk about the Annunciation because the Annunciation is where it all starts. And the great angel Gabriel comes to Mary and explains to her that she is going to be pregnant with a very, very important baby. All right. So she is told about this and she questions the angel a little bit. She says, well, how could this be since I have not been with a man? That's a very good question. But the angel explains to her that the a Holy Spirit is going to overpower her and she will be receive a child through the power of the Holy Spirit. So then what of course happens is that uh, Mary responds with a way we will never forget. I wrote it down here. She says, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. So whenever we look at Mary in the Bible, whenever we see her, and we see her a lot more than people think, she represents what faith she has the ultimate faith even given this strange explanation she will have the messiah she will have this blessed child she doesn't believe she doesn't believe it for a second but then she believes it she says i have faith let it be according to your word i'm in coach put me in i want to serve you god and that's what mary does and it's amazing but then what does mary do well she doesn't take any time at all she leaves and she goes four to five days travel to see her cousin elizabeth because she's so excited. This is what happens when we are when we have a baby, right? When we're pregnant, we get so excited and we want to visit and share it with someone who's experiencing just what we're experiencing or has experienced it, right? I'll never forget, there's my daughter right there and I'll never forget when she was born, we went through, I shouldn't say we, my wife right here went through 21 hours of grueling labor on the first uh, child that we had and of course, it was uh, very harrowing to me as a young father. I didn't know what was going on, and I had to kind of get through it and get through it with the doctors and everything like that. But then Zoe was born. We were thrilled, and I figured, well, my wife can go to sleep now. She's been through this torment for 21 hours. No! I turned around. They took the baby away to clean her up, and I turned around. She's on the telephone. So she's talk she's talking like for maybe four or five hours with various different people about this baby, okay? And this is the same thing that's happening with Mary, right? She's excited. She hears about this baby and she's like, wow, this is amazing. I can't believe it. Who does she go to see? Well, she wants to go to see someone you can relate with. Now, Coco, when she was talking to people, who did she call? Well, she called her friends who already had kids, and she kind of talked about and compared labor stories. That's what women do, right? <laughs> and so Mary did the same thing with Elizabeth. She went four or five days, traveled to do this. You had to do that in the old days. They didn't have telephones. So she went four or five days, and she found Elizabeth. Now, what was so special about Elizabeth? Well, Elizabeth, of course, had a miracle baby, too. She was an old woman. She didn't think she'd ever have a child. But God gave her John the Baptist as a miracle, and she was thrilled. So Mary finally gets to this little town where Elizabeth is. She walks up, and what happens? Come on, you all know. You heard the story 20,000 times. The baby jumped in her womb, right? The baby jumps in Elizabeth's womb, and uh, she is amazed by this, right? And she can't believe it. So John the Baptist jumps, and then what, is, what does Elizabeth say? She says the second line of the Hail Mary prayer. She says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, right? That's what... Elizabeth says because she realizes what's going on. John the Baptist is jumping in her womb. Why is he jumping? He's jumping because he's in the presence of his Lord, right? And he is an unborn child. So there he is. He's, he's sitting there. He says, wow, I'm in the presence of Jesus. And he jumps and he jumps and he's so excited about that. And she says, look, when you walked in, my baby jumped in the womb because he was so excited to be in the presence of of the Lord, right? And so what does she do? She finally says to Mary, she's amazed at Mary's face, and she says, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So once again, Elizabeth says, wow, you've got this faith. It's unbelievable. You believe what's going on, and it's really true. My baby jumped in my womb because you are carrying the Lord Jesus Christ. You are carrying that baby. Okay. Why? Okay, so one now why you got you got John the Baptist here. Why is he able to 
to know that that's Jesus. He's able to know that's Jesus because the Holy Spirit tells him. You know, if you're a baby and you're in your mother's womb, you can't tell that there's another baby in someone else's womb. You don't know that, right? But the Holy Spirit has revealed this to John the Baptist, and he jumps. He is so excited. So keep those two things in mind. Faith and the Holy Spirit, all right? Two unborn children in the presence of each other, one our Lord, one John the Baptist, and they have this miraculous encounter. It shows how God cares about children in the womb. This is not a story I don't think that he threw in for, for no reason. He's saying that I love these children. I have made them. They are mine. I have, I have made them, uh, like in Psalm 139, right? I've made them with my own hands and crafted them. So this is the special life of these children. Okay, so a lot of times in the pro-life movement, you get frustrated. You say, oh, man, I'm out here in the cold. I can't believe this again. I'm doing this stuff again, but nothing happens. I try to get my pastor to preach on this. He never does because he's, he's an old 70s guy, and I can't, I can't get anyone to come along with me, and it gets really, really frustrating. But you know what? I am so encouraged over the years how this movement has changed. We started a Lutherans for Life group back in Fairfax Station in 1996, and when we did, we started our first March for Life service. We had 40 people, and half those people were a a, a youth group from St. Louis, a Lutheran youth group from St. Louis. We were like, oh, 40 people, man, that is horrible. Was, we were so frustrated and downcast and everything like that. But now I look at the group that we have for the March for Life. We have standing room only in this church in Alexandria. We can't fit everybody in it. We had a Lutheran group that was actually leading the March for Life this year. We have a bigger uh, chapter than ever. We have a bigger Lutherans for Life group ever. We have these huge conferences that the Lutheran Church Missouri Center does downtown every other year. It's a different world right those people that weren't participating are participating now and a lot of them are young we're seeing the young groups and that millennial group are involved more than ever they're much more pro-life than us baby boomers and thank god for that that is a subtle blessing so when you think about that and you think about all the abortion clinics like like ruby was talking about fairfax here in falls church manassas they're all for falling like dominoes and why it's because we're winning we're changing minds we're changing hearts we're turning hearts to jesus christ we're receiving forgiveness in Jesus, and it's doing everything. Why are we doing it? We're doing it because we have the Spirit. We've gotten the Spirit that John the Baptist has. We can recognize what's going on, what God's Word is saying, and that is making all the difference, isn't it? Okay, so remember, we need to keep that faith of Mary, that faith of Mary that she has. When the angel told her she's going to have a baby, they, Mary says, I believe it. I believe it. I'm willing to follow you, Jesus, right? And we need to trust in that Holy Spirit. That's, a, that's another key thing. You know, the Holy Spirit allowed John the Baptist to understand what was going on, and the Holy Spirit lets us know what's going on, too. Sometimes in the pro-life movement, or really just in our Christian lives, we have to listen to what the Holy Spirit says. That's what I do when I go in the hospital. Sometimes I say, I'm not supposed to go into that room, but I'm going into that room because the Holy Spirit tells me to do it. And I do it, and I have an incredible encounter. And this happens all the time. I think we need to do that in the pro-life movement, too. We see a woman that may be in trouble, a woman who's in a right here in front of an abortion clinic. We need to come up and tell them we're going to help them, love them, and help them have that baby. And we need to also talk to people. I mean, you young people are the people that, oh, we don't have too many young people here. But if we did have young people, it's important. You know, that's, that's the people that women confide in. They say, well, I'm pregnant. I don't know what to do. Wow. I mean, that's an opening that we all wish we had, right? That, that opening. And that's something that the millennial kids can really get involved in saying, you know, there are other alternatives and you can make that happen. So that's a blessing. Okay, so let's, let's, all, let's all then pray together here. Oh, my Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving Mary that kind of faith that allowed her to say yes to life and to the, the life of our Savior, Lord. Thank you for that Holy Spirit that gave, that gave John the Baptist the ability to understand that his Lord was in his presence. And we need that faith and that Holy Spirit today for this movement, for the 40 Days for Life, as we work to end this scourge of abortion that is in this country and is destroying it, Lord. But we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see your promised land, and we see a day when we will have no more abortions in this country. And we are going to be faithful, and we are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to lift this movement up in the name of Jesus Christ, our Amen. Savior and Lord. Amen.